Right, good evening everyone. Uh, welcome, whether you are here, present at Covent Garden, whether you're watching live on YouTube, uh, or whether you're watching uh, at a later date on YouTube, welcome to you all. Um, the usual house management for those that are here in person, uh, we're not expecting any alarms to go off and hopefully they won't, uh, but if they do, you have an exit behind me in front of you uh, on the right hand side, uh, or if it's safe to do so, uh, you can go out the way you came in, uh, but in all emergency circumstances we'll be guided by uh, our museum uh, manager. Okay, before I introduce tonight's speaker, just a little look ahead to what's coming up. Uh, our last meeting in the calendar year of 2021 uh, will be on uh, Monday the 13th of December in uh, four weeks' time. Uh, that will be a talk by Oliver Green on London's great railway stations. Uh, that talk coincides uh, almost precisely now, because I think the publication has been put back a few weeks, uh, of a book that Oliver Green um, has written on that very subject, London's Railway Stations, uh, with photos by a colleague of his, Benjamin Graham. Uh, if you do come to that meeting, uh, and if you are minded to purchase a copy of the book, uh, and if you so wish, um, Oliver will sign those books for you uh, before he gives his presentation uh, on the 13th of December. Uh, we have two uh, notified uh, visits and other uh, events coming up, both of which were in the last issue of Friends News. Uh, there's a walk around this area here, London Theatre Land, uh, on the evening of the 5th of December, and looking much further ahead, uh, there is a Sunday lunch on the Kent and East Sussex Railway on the 10th of April next year. There are still places on both of those, so if you are interested, uh, please follow the instructions in uh, the issue of Friends News as to how you uh, book and reserve a place. Uh, we are working on more visits, uh, at least two of which will take place before uh, the April uh, event in early uh, 2022, uh, and the details of those uh, will be in the January issue of Friends News. I think that's all I need to say by way of general introduction and parish notices, so let me introduce, without further ado, our speaker, Mike Ashworth, will be known to many of you, I guess. Uh, he was, uh, prior to retirement, at the Underground's Design and Heritage Manager. Uh, and before that, 30 years ago, he tells me, uh, he was a curator here at London Transport Museum. Uh, he's going to talk tonight on the more recent addition to uh, the Underground Heritage, which is the architecture of the Jubilee Line. Mike, over to you. Thank you, Barry. <clears throat> Good evening. It, it always worries me slightly when you applaud before I start talking rather than when I finish. Um, but yes, it's a pleasure to be back here uh, in Covent Garden. It's, it's always strange when you retire from a place. Obviously, I left London Underground four years ago, and I feel as if I should be an exhibit in the museum. But my career path was slightly unusual in that I started here and went into the operational railway in around 2001. And as Barry said, I was the design and heritage manager for London Underground. Um, and that I had three major responsibilities, um, one of which was obviously the conservation of the underground's heritage, so that was responsibility with the management of nearly 80 listed buildings out of 275, um, and a very large number of railway heritage features that we ourselves in London Underground had. Um, I was also responsible for customer-facing aspects of station and train design, which is a polite way of saying the architecture of rebuilt and new stations. Uh, and also underground rolling stock. So it was a, a unique experience to work for the underground for so many years with such a, a widespread remit over the company's history. Um, the one thing that retirement enables you to do, although Barry says I have to be careful what I say, is it means I'm no longer quite as constrained as I was when I worked for the company in terms of what I can discuss about stations. Um, and what we're going to look at this evening is a very personal take on some of the Jubilee Line extension stations um, that, of course, opened in 1999 and 2000, just on the cusp of 2000. And it was one of the earliest projects I became involved in when I started working for London Transport Museum, and that we were amongst the first people on the day that the underground took occupancy of the Old St. Stephen's Club at Westminster. 
um, and I was also there on the day that station opened. It was 28th of December, 1999. Um, and the museum were actively involved in the JLE project. We stole quite a lot of things for the museum, uh, including a section of the original 1890 tunnel, the CSLR tunnels from London Bridge. I think we asked for three complete rings and they sent us two lorry loads, which was slightly embarrassing at the time. Um, and also an attempt to get a complete district railway column out of Westminster Station, which failed when the tower crane started to bend over. Um, but nevertheless, the Jubilee Line extension was quite close, is quite close to my heart, both in terms of the fact that I saw it being constructed, um, I saw it being opened, um, and then I became responsible for effectively ensuring that these very important stations, um, which now form part of the underground's history, that might seem slightly strange for stations that I think we still regard as being quite modern and new. Um, many of you will know the story. There are the torturous story of the Jubilee Line, but I thought it would be useful um, to actually just nip back into the past a little bit. Um, the logo that I'm showing on the screen at the moment, of course, is from the 1979 opening brochure designed by William Fenton, ARA. Um, and I must admit, I've always rather liked this. You don't see this as often as you see, say, the Victoria Line opening logos. But I thought we'd just have a skip back and have a little look. Um, first of all, I won't be stopping at every station on the extension, you'll be pleased to know. Um, we will be skipping quite a few, skip-stop service in this case. Um, but it will give us an opportunity to look at some of the key ones, and I think probably the most interesting ones uh, on the line extension. But as I mentioned, um, give you a little taster of what we'll be, where we'll be going and what we'll be looking at. I won't ask you to shout the answers out. Um, I'll ask you that at the end of the talk. <laughs> Make sure you've all been listening. Um, but of course, the history of the Jubilee Line, bizarrely, goes back to London's oldest underground railway, in that respect, the Metropolitan Railway. Um, and in fact, the origins of some of the planning issues and debates around the Jubilee Line uh, largely go back to the opening of the Stanmore branch of the Metropolitan, which occurred in 1932. And you can see there, that's the brochure for the opening of it. Um, but it did leave the Metropolitan Railway with a bit of a headache. And, of course, that headache rapidly transferred to London Transport when it was formed in 1933. And that was the Metropolitan's <coughs> longing for building branches into rural Middlesex so it could enable house building, um, led to some severe congestion problems south of its station at Finchley Road into Baker Street, um, which is still to this day only a two-track railway, two-track tunnel. And the Metropolitan itself had various ideas to deal with that issue, which largely coalesced around the idea of building some sort of deep-level tube line, which either would have terminated at Baker Street or in a loop under central London. But the Met never really got that off the stocks, and it was left to London Transport and the New Works Programme of 1935 to 1940 to look at some options around easing the congestion uh, on that section of the Metropolitan that came in the form of a new tunnel, largely <coughs> as the Metropolitan had had the ideas, a new tunnel running south from Finchley Road with cross-platform interchange, uh, dropping down to two new stations, uh, including St John's Wood and Swiss Cottage, and then linking in to the existing Bakerloo line um, to, cause, to form a second northern branch uh, from the original 1906 railway. Um, and that opened, as you can see there, on the 20th of November 1939, one of the last acts, pre-war acts, of the New Works Programme, of course, which subsequently saw subsequent delays and indeed cancellations of part of its programme due to wartime extinguishes. I thought I'd just throw that little vignette in. It's actually from probably about 1950 in an Ian Allen book. <coughs> it's by A.N.W. Wollstonehome in Scraperboard. And it gives you an idea, really, actually, of course, of the the new Tube Railway, the 1938 rolling stock there on the left, on the Bakerloo Line Stanmore branch, um, just north of Neesden with a power station in the background. Um, and of course this was to be a very familiar sight on the Bakerloo Line for many years. Um, just to give you an idea of two maps there, <coughs> the 1939 map shows quite clearly the dotted line showing the extension um, of the Bakerloo line, which of course was only actually new between Finchley Road and, and, and Baker Street. You can see there Acacia Road Station was one of the proposed names. And the Bakerloo basically became very successful. 
Um, the proposed extension to Camberwell that you can see on the second map here, the 1950 map, was partially designed to enable a better service by building a, a more operational terminus at Camberwell, with three platforms rather than the crossovers that we still have at Elephant and Castle. Because, in fact, the Bakerloo line extension gave the Bakerloo overall a bit of a problem. The central area became extremely stressed, um, and indeed, during the 1950s, and into the 1960s at various times, the Bakerloo was one of the most crowded lines uh, in the central area. Um, and of course, any railway that has a single branch at one end and two branches at the other does lead to some degree of operational complexity in terms of flighting trains and ensuring that timetables work. So various proposals to assist in breaking that problem came up. And they were largely around... I won't go too much into the history of the, the post-Second World War plans for London railways. Suffice to say, of course, that one that was built, almost in its entirety, Line C, the Victoria Line, but there was also a series of east-west lines, Lines 3 and 4, um, which basically looked at extending some form of railway in deep level under the City of London and out either north or south of the River Thames. Um, and London Transport worked this up, post-Victoria Line, and started to look at what was to be called the Fleet Line, basically because it ran underneath Fleet Street. Um, I think a lot of people think it's you know, associated, as it is obviously, with the Fleet River, although I think it follows the Tyburn arguably more closely in terms of where the line was going. And construction started on this section um, south of Baker Street to split the Bakerloo back up again, um, and that opened uh, the first section between Baker Street and Charing Cross, in 1979. Now, the name had been formalised around the Jubilee line in 1977. Um, and just a couple of illustrations here. One very fine, one of the, almost I think probably the last of the cutaway diagrams of stations issued by a poster for London Transport showing changes at Bond Street Station. The top right shows you some of the very typical late 70s internal architecture on Jubilee line stations. This is at uh, Baker Street and includes the very fine panels by Robin Jakes, who, of course, was Hattie Jakes' brother. Um, and I must admit, when I was in charge of such things in the underground, I made a very strong case for retention of, of the panels here at Baker Street, but also at least one of this style of architecture. And not, it's a bit out of fashion at the moment, sort of pop art, lurid colours, but probably Bond Street um, or Green Park is one of the best examples. But I have to admit to playing a role in getting rid of the lime green ticket kiosks that you see down below here at Charing Cross. Um, they were a particular dislike of one senior manager in the underground. And when we did the work at Charing Cross a few years ago, um, these were one thing that went. And in a bizarre way, I have slight regrets. They were so unusual and so different. You never know, in 50 years' time, somebody might be applying for a grant to rebuild those, in which case I'd best keep a low profile. The interesting things in some respects started with what to do east of Charing Cross. Um, I could spend an entire lecture discussing the options that London Transport and the politicians went through at various times during the 70s and 80s. Uh, would it go north of the river? Would it go south of the river? Would it go to Thamesmead? Would it go to Lewisham? Would it take the East London Line extension over? Uh, you know, as you can see here, 101 different routes, perhaps not as many as 101, but quite a sizable number of options were looked at. Um, but the development of the Docklands um, by the late 1980s really started to spur serious thought, actually, as to helping drive the redevelopment of the eastern parts of London, um, with not only the DLR, but also some form of heavy metro. Um, and the river line, as it became known at one point, um, very soon became effectively part of the eastern extension. And you can see in the brochure from 1979 here on the right that there were a very strong case at the time to drive it to two branches, one at Beckton, where the depot would have been, and the other south of the river to Thamesmead. Um, but a lot of development, well, not a lot, um, there was some development money put into the options for this, um, which meant that Canary Wharf soon started to become the main focus of the new extension, um, and indeed a change of terminus to drive it north, um, partially using XBR line, lands, uh, to a new terminus at Stratford, 
And this was largely sanctioned in 1990 uh, under a new Act of Parliament. And construction largely started in 1993. There were some earlier works around 1991-92 in terms of preparation, but the real digging of the holes started in 1993. Now, I'm sure, given what's going on with Crossrail Stroke, the Elizabeth Line at the moment, um, I think many of us who were in the company or associated with the company at the time, the construction and opening of the Jubilee Line seemed to be quite a torrid affair. In fact, it does... It's interesting watching what Crossrail and Elizabeth Line is going through at the moment. The delays in construction of the Jubilee Line were largely caused by the collapse at Heathrow of the tunnels being built for the Heathrow Express using the new Austrian tunnelling method. And that certainly caused some substantial, nearly a year's delay to construction on parts of the actual Jubilee Line itself. But nevertheless, the line was opened eventually in 19 sections in 1999, and just shy of the year 2000 and the Millennium Dome, of course, which was constructed at North Greenwich. And interestingly enough, North Greenwich was one of the latter stations planned on the line. Originally, it would have stayed north of the river. Um, but again, as a development opportunity, and the opportunity to drive it through um, a brownfield site at North Greenwich was taken, and the station was built then. We should now, finally, start looking at some station architecture, shouldn't we? But it's important, before we start talking about the stations themselves, um, to mention this man, who I met once in his office at Canary Wharf when I was stealing things from the museum. <laughs> Rowland Palotti was the consulting and commissioning architect for the Jubilee Line extension. Now, his appointment, I have been told, ruffled a few feathers in London Transport's architects department at the time. Um, he was, you know, I think the underground's own architecture department felt that they should have possibly a bigger role in it. But Paolotti, of course, came with a lot of experience, most notably from the Hong Kong metro. Um, and he commissioned not only some very interesting architects, um, but he allowed them a degree of latitude in terms of the fact that each station, um, although they had to conform to certain, if you like, guiding rules, um, nevertheless, each of the stations and the architects had quite a degree of latitude in what it was they could do with that station site once they had the brief for the actual requirements for the operational station. Um, Palotti's feeling was that the line itself would be held together by a, de a series of common design threads, one of which was the use of materials, so largely industrial, this large-scale use of exposed concrete, the very bare bones of many of these stations, the use of corporate colours, such as blue and grey, um, and important company, if you like, trademarks, signage, the use of Johnson lettering, the freeze plates that would help tie the line identity together very strongly, um, from Stratford through to the new terminus, of course, at Westminster and Green Park, because the extension meant the closure of the existing Charing Cross branch um, of the railway. So... We'll start looking at some sites, and in fact the first one we look at isn't a station. <laughs> um, Stratford Market Depot was constructed on the site of the old West Ham Abbey, and in fact the site clearance involved the um, excavation of a very large number of Cistercian monks' bodies, um, which were relocated to a new funeral plot, I think in Suffolk if I remember rightly. Um, but nevertheless, this is really a very impressive building. I don't know if any of you have ever had the chance to visit it. We used to do open house tours here. Um, and it really is quite remarkable. You see this vast single span roof um, at an angle, um, which accommodates effectively all the train roads that you can see the large Johnson numerals up above. And it means that inside, you have this entirely uncluttered floor space. There, is, there are no upright stanchions within the car sheds themselves. Um, and the control room that you see just to the left here, in rather a 1930s style in some respects, slightly circular, but of course to give full vision across the depot fan and onto the railway itself. Um, and I must admit, I've always felt this is amongst the many impressive pieces of architecture on the JLE, um, this is actually probably one of the best ones. Um, and it's one that you'll least likely see. You get glancing, fleeting views of it if you're on the train going to or from Stratford. But if you ever do get, I don't know if open house still do tours here, 
If you ever do get the chance to visit it, it really is well worth a look. This was by Chris Wilkinson's um, The Architect. It opened in 1998, and the reason for a depot at West Ham Stratford was quite straightforward. First of all, it was to allow, of course, easier operation from the east end of the railway, the new line, and secondly, to relieve congestion at Neasden, um, where, of course, previously uh, the Jubilee line stock had actually been maintained. It was far too small for the requirements of the new line itself. But we're actually going to pop back on the train now and go on Station South, which is West Ham. Um, I've always liked this station. Um, I must admit, for various reasons. It, it, it took a while to grow on me. But it's by Van Hennigan and Howard. Um, and it's an interesting layout, of course, in that the station isn't just single entrance. It has to deal with quite complex flows in terms of the interchange between the district um, network rail or C2C lines, um, the Jubilee line extension and what is now the DLR. Um, so this requires not only if you like a degree of flow across the site, but it also requires passengers to move through different levels to achieve that interchange. You actually have to come downstairs off the district line platform to go back upstairs to get across to the Jubilee and the DLR platforms. So in fact the flow, if you like, the vertical flow as well as the horizontal flow of passengers through this station is quite complex and it requires a change of direction at least twice. So it's a complex puzzle in many respects to actually in, actually design in terms of the flow that you require of customers. In many respects, of course, it echoes back to some of the Charles Holden stations of the 1930s, in that what you have here is a much more modern take on exposed reinforced concrete with brick infill, um, on a much bigger scale, of course. But I think, interestingly enough, again, with the use of the clock tower, for example, if you look at somewhere like Osterley or Boston Manor, an idea of a focal point for the grouping of the station itself. Um, and the brickwork actually is very well done, it's very well executed at this station site. So this is the street entrance, um, which is actually where the minimal of passengers enter and leave this station because of the interchange. But moving in, on the left there you see the actual main ticket hall. Um, and again, quite strong echoes in some respects of Charles Holden's buildings. Um, this is a very long, thin, narrow space. Um, so in fact, actually, the, the lift, the visual lift up to the ceiling here is quite impressive in, in a way. Um, but it's very intuitive in terms of it leads you through to the main exchange hall that you see here on the right. Um, and you can see there the low level of the bridge that is required effectively underneath the C2C and, and the district lines. Um, to enable interchange onto those two existing lines. If we swing round to the main escalator bank, um, and again here you can see really the form of a large atrium, with the escalators moving customers up to the upper bridge deck level with the lifts, and again the use of exposed brickwork, and a very industrial feel to the interior um, there's absolutely no attempt here at disguising service runs. It's all very industrial, but it's remarkably well handled in many respects. The top left photo there shows you the overbridge itself as it lifts over the road that separates the two sites. And the main picture here shows you the interior of that cross overbridge. It's not cross overbridge, I should say, it's quite well behaved, but nevertheless. It's an overbridge across the tracks, I should say, shouldn't I? You can edit that out afterwards. But what you see here, again, is two main things. First of all, that very exposed nature of the soffits um, with the services threaded through, and also the light. And this was achieved by using a very simple solution, which is large proportions of these square glass blocks, um, which, of course, adapt to the modularity of the space itself, and also allow a large amount of light to flow into the station. Um, so it gives you a very clean line in many respects to the interior. The lower left photo just gives you an idea, looking back on the station, of what that achieves in terms of the stacking nature of what are effectively these glass cubes on top of the plinth formed out of brick. 
So it gives you a very, very strong succession down the staircases onto what here are the DLR platforms themselves. This is the top of the escalators down onto the Jubilee line platforms um, with the side flanking passageways leading to the lifts at the far end. And again, you can see the continuity of design uh, all the way through this station. There's a very consistent flow of approach. And down onto the platform, which are actually very high structures. Um, in a way, you could have argued, I suppose, as a designer, that you might have wanted to try and subdivide that internal elevation. Um, but here, actually, they're carried full height to the top of the building line straight across. But you can see here very clever use. Again, echoing some of the 1930s design details, these very carefully designed brick recesses which act as the back of the seating panels, which actually are built in, which is always a nice touch in the fact, actually, that you know, the benches aren't added into the design here. They're actually an integral part of the fabric of the station. And again, finished off, in a way, by the use of the large roundels acting as the backing of that. And an ex-colleague of mine showing that those benches are used. It looks like Edmund Bird, TfL's heritage advisor. Um, but to give you an idea of the scale of the station with one of the Jubilee Line trains sitting in it. Um, I must admit, I, I think this is really an impressive station in terms of one of our more modern ones. I do like its hints um, at the architecture of the past, but it really does bring a very modern, quite sparse feeling um, to the late 20th century architecture on the underground. So a very impressive site. We're moving down the line now. Um, um, we're not going to stop at Canning Town because uh, we might be here too long if we do that. But we are actually going to look at, well, a bus station rather than the tube station for a moment, which is one of the most threatened buildings on the network at the moment. Um, and I will come back to this issue, um, I think, towards the end of the talk. Um, but redevelopment has been threatening um, North Greenwich Bus Station, which was designed by Sir Norman Foster and partners, um, which I suspect is a great shame. Um, because not only is this interesting from an architectural point of view, um, it's also actually a fairly remarkable bus station. And it's interesting at the moment, I've been doing some work um, working with Save Britain's Heritage and the 20th Century Society. Um, and I think those of us in the industry have been aware for a long time of the rate of attrition of bus and coach stations in the UK. and really are becoming quite an endangered species. And it's strange that one of the most modern ones in Britain, and arguably one of the most successful ones, is indeed itself now, um, just over 30 years on from opening, um, threatened with demolition. What Foster does is he uses this great sweeping semicircle of a building um, to encapsulate the upper shaft escalator shaft levels of North Greenwich Tube Station. And this very wide aspect, of course, allows for an easy flow of buses around the perimeter which forms the bus station. And the very uncluttered nature of the interior means that the customer can have very clear sight lines through to the vehicles, uh, and also to the stops that they require. And it's proved to be a remarkably important interchange. And the car parking at this site, for example, was certainly, when I worked for the company, um, one of the most important access points for mobility-impaired passengers, because obviously the extension generally was, at the time, uh, one of the most enabling uh, for people with uh, impaired mobility. Um, and also the car parking here is actually remarkably close um, to the station. So I'm really hoping that later current plans for this station actually retain this building. I think it's an incredibly important one. And of course we shall be coming back to Foster uh, in a minute. But we're going to turn our attention now to what goes on underground in the great box that was dug at North Greenwich and have a brief look at the station that was designed and built by Alsop, Lyle and Stormer. Um, and this is really quite a tour de force in many respects. Um, the station box is remarkably wide because at this point the tracks actually, there are three tracks, there's a turnback siding at North Greenwich. North Greenwich was initially proposed to be one of the more important turnback sites uh, for trains to, to reverse the 
originally there wasn't a feeling that not every train needed to go to Stratford, and my how that has changed over the years. Um, so it's a remarkably wide station box. And you approach by coming down the escalators, and the one thing that you do get here is effectively you can see the full length of the box because the architects chose to suspend the upper mezzanine deck right across the middle of the box. It straddles the box. Um, and this allows you very clear views of actually where the entrances and exits to the platforms are, which of course are the next level down. Um, it's similar in some respects in concept to what's being delivered at Whitechapel for the Crossrail Works, where of course the new main entrance and ticket hall effectively lifts over what was the East London line, station box in a much smaller scale. But this, as I say, is on a fairly gigantic scale. Um, and to give you an idea of what it looks like down at platform level, um, you see this remarkable, you know, the bare bones of the construction of this station. Everywhere you look, there's no hiding the construction technique uh, or details of this station. This general openness means that with use of lighting, and I shall come back to that point in a second, um, the use of lighting enables you actually to highlight where you want the passengers to go. Um, so very clearly, in some respects, you can see your way to the bottom of the escalators, where the escalators are. So there's uh, an awful lot of visibility of flow pattern in this station. I think the other brave thing here, in many respects, of course, is although it's very industrial in feel, um, are the use of these dark colours. Um, and they chose to use this dark, almost corporate, Colbert blue mosaic tile to cover nearly all the main structural surfaces. Um, and not only does that highlight it, it actually, I think, remar works remarkably well. Um, we did have one slight problem a few years ago when somebody put a nice piece of galvanised trunking all the way down one of those legs. Um, and we did actually manage to get it taken off again. You can just see there's a plug creeping in at the bottom of there. Um, the use of colour in a station such as this is, is interesting. Um, I think there's always a strong supposition or feeling, certainly in station design, that because you're underground and in confined spaces that you should use white tiles everywhere. And I know certainly the design team I was part of was accused of making the underground look highly lavatorial at various times. We seem to develop a bit of a predilection for stripping coloured tiles off and putting white tiles up. Um, we didn't always, <laughs> I must admit, but it is interesting in that if you go to people generally and just say, if you were to dig a, a deep passageway underground you know, no light, what colour would you paint it? Everybody goes, well, you paint it white, because, of course, it makes it look bigger. And the problem with white and reflective surfaces in spaces, and certainly the way that we are required to light them in the underground, is around reflectivity. Um, and, in fact, quite, quite many occasions, um, it's interesting, actually, you end up with glaring surfaces, which are arguably as much of a problem in terms of people... Um, with visual disabilities in terms of what they can actually see in terms of contrast between the structural elements, the corners, the doorways, the portals and the passageways. Quite interesting. And it's something that we gave a, a lot of thought to um, in some of the station designs we worked on. Here, this is absolutely the boldest thing that you could think of. You take one of the darkest colours in the palette and use it basically as your main colour all the way through the station. Um, and it works, of course, because it is the ultimate contrast to the space around um, that you have here. It requires just this rather minimal, you can see these head height use of orange strips. Um, but it actually does delineate the structure and therefore delineates the space that you want is available for your passenger to use. <clears throat> it's interesting, I was down in the new Nine Elms and Battersea station a few weeks ago which were amongst the last station designs I, I helped um, work on, or I worked on. Um, and it's very easy, of course, for me to say as a retiree that uh, it wouldn't have happened, it wouldn't look like that if I'd been in charge. Um, I was always slightly wary of the use of large expanses of stainless steel in station interiors because of that reflectivity issue. You end up with an awful lot of blur, blurry look, mirror looks, you know, reflections. 
Um, and this, in some respects, I think, demonstrates actually what you can do if you have knowledge of colour and space. I think this works remarkably well. Well, moving one down, and I think this is a bit of a blurry image, so my apologies for that, but I thought it'd be useful um, before we have a look at the inside of Canary Wharf Station just to give you an idea of the scale of the undertaking, the scale of the excavation that was required at this station and indeed at many of them. Now, effectively, these were brownfield sites, so it enabled the construction basically of a vast box but, of course, the complication here at Canary Wharf was uh, you know, the, <laughs> the rather large-scale nearness of water and the fact that you were building this at the bottom of what had been a dock. Um, so, in fact, actually the structure, the concrete box structure that you see that contains the station itself is enormous in scale um, and also drives down a great deal underneath the platform level of the station and underneath the platform and the tracks is, is, is quite a degree, actually, you can see a lower level of service, service rooms and, and corridors. Um, Canary Wharf, I think, has become, interestingly enough, emblematic um, of underground stations in London. It's, it's one of those stations, I think, if you flick a picture of the station entrances up, most people would now associate it with London in some shape or form. And the iconic nature of that building is very well deserved. <clears throat> um, what you see here, the main photo, of course, is the main station box. Um, and Foster chose to have this gullwing construction roof, which runs nearly the full length of the public areas of the station. It doesn't run the full length of the station box, because, in fact, the station box is probably about a third as big again at either end with the emergency staircases. Um, but this soaring, real cathedral-like nave of a building um, basically is remarkably open, which is extremely useful for an underground station um, in terms of people being able to navigate their way around. And it also, of course, benefits from the great translucent nature of the entry arch here, of course, this vast atrium that covers the western entrances, the main entrances to the station, which are balanced by a smaller eastern entrance, I should say, at the other end. Um, this soaring nature, um, we struggled with, of course, a few years ago with commercial advertising, <laughs> with the proposal to put digital advertising screens in at this station. Um, and I have to admit that my colleagues at the time in commercial development actually did heed advice, um, and we went back to Foster's to design the hanging screens to make sure that they are more, if you like, inherent, they're, they're more holistic in terms of the station design um, than had previously been perhaps proposed. But you can see here, down the staircases to the intermediate level through the gate line here, the entrances at either side of this main ticket hall uh, give access to the rather subterranean caverns of shopping centres and office entrances at Canary Wharf. And then the passenger leads down another series of escalators to the platform level. And probably the highlight here, um, uh, the use, again, interestingly enough, of a sort of 1930s, 50s idea, um, of these large-scale benches um, utilising the roundel as their back. I mean, these really do echo back to the 1930s ones, places like High Street Kensington, but on a much bigger scale. These are massive. Um, so these, in fact, become part of the highlight <coughs> of the station uh, at platform level, um, as well as giving you a very clear indication of which station that it is that you are at. Um, and I suppose the other thing that we should mention here, of course, is that the extension was the first widespread use of platform edge doors on the underground um, that you can see here at the edges. If we board the train and continue our station west, our, tra our travels west, um, we are skipping Canada Water Station, which again is actually an interesting one. But I thought we'd just take a, a quick look at Bermondsey Station, um, which is by Ian Ritchie. Um, and it's interesting in that this was one of the stations that was always designed a bit like the Leslie Green stations of 1906 and 1907. Um, with the ability to act as a plinth for an oversight development. And, of course, the issue of oversight development has come what 
has come somewhat to the fore with some of the Jubilee Line stations in recent years. And it always amuses me slightly that the one that was intended, one of the ones that was intended to have an OSD on, it still doesn't have one. But then neither does Chalk Farm, I keep telling myself, or Lambeth North. Um, the best laid plans. But Ian Ritchie very deliberately designed the station so that it would continue to work architecturally in terms of its feel um, should an oversight development be constructed above it. And this is the maquette model of the station um, shown to the planning department at the time. And it gives you a, a very good idea of the incredible amount of light that is let into this station, um, as you can see here from above. To show you the building in reality, um, again, a simple structure in many respects above ground. It's quite ephemeral in some respects, you could say, because of the fact that there was always potentially the possibility of actually reconstructing or building above. But here you see actually what are effectively the, uh, the glass panels, the atriums, above the interior of the station. It's a difficult station to photograph, so my apologies for this. Um, and it's partially due to the fact, of course, it's called light, <laughs> which is one thing the architect wanted to bring into this station. And indeed, it's one of the very few stations that at platform level, at the east end of the platforms, um, you actually can see daylight, um, which is because it flows down the escalator shafts here. This is the main access down onto the platforms from the station ticket hall, which is at an intermediate level. You actually come in at street level, you go down to an intermediate level before you drop down. And you can see here the well, which runs the full height of the building from platform level, the base of the escalators, right up to ceiling level and the atrium level uh, above street level. So this is an incredible drop, if you like, down the side of the station box. But it does give you a very clear idea of the flow. It's fascinating here in that as you move up and down the escalators, you can see people on the street, sort of at head height almost. And when you're on the street, you can see very clearly into the station. So you see passengers move in and out, backwards and forwards through the station. So that idea of flow is very, very strongly represented uh, in, in terms of the layout and design of the building. One of the most striking features of this is at the east end where the escalators drop down um, to platform concourse level, which are the use of these incredibly sculptural beams which effectively, of course, hold that hole in the ground up. Um, and I say sculptural because they really are this vast crisscross nature of these beams that effectively hold the box up and apart. And in some respects, they, I suppose, remind you of Westminster Station, where, of course, those great crossbars hold the station box apart um, because of ground pressure. Um, but a very sculptural feel to this station at platform level. Um, I have to say that there's an awful lot of, well, there was certainly at the time, an awful lot of chit-chat and urban myth about Ian Ritchie architects um, and... Um, some illicit signage and seating that was delivered to this station. And the story goes that Richie's actually did a reversed out version of the station freezes with white lettering on a blue background. Um, and indeed, I have seen a fragment of that. Um, apparently, the underground weren't at all impressed with this shift away from corporate standards. And the myth always was, was that the day before the station opened, it was all removed, <laughs> along with some of the glass benches. Um, but I wonder if that's not part of the mythology of the underground, uh, and certainly of the Jubilee line, um, that was built up even at that time. But very, very fine building in many respects. We're going to move on now. We're going to pass through London Bridge. Um, London Bridge Station, I would love to show you if, if time allowed, um, because, of course, what's most interesting about London Bridge is it's a good example of actually where you have to feed a new railway through an existing and very complex station. So London Bridge not only was about the Jubilee line, it was also, of course, about a major uh, capacity upgrade on the station, which included um, boring new tunnels for the northern line that runs through the station there. And that, as I mentioned before, is where we stole some of the original 18... Well, sorry, not the... Yeah, the original 1890 tunnel uh, from the diversion routes that we got from there. But... 
The last station I thought we should alight on um, is the one that's actually drawn most attention over the last few years, in fact, just after I left um, the company four years ago, um, which is Southwark Station, which is by McCormack, Jameson and Pritchard. Um, and this is a perspective sketch by Duncan Lamb, who some of you may recall, of course, but uh, for the Underground's Architecture Department. Um, Southwark's an interesting station in that, of course, it was the, one of the stations that nearly didn't happen. It was a bit of a, a, a late starter in terms of planning. Um, from a capacity and operational point of view, it would have been far easier to be able to run trains non-stop between Waterloo and London Bridge. The Underground doesn't much like frequent stops. Um, <laughs> It's something we learned in the 30s um, when Frank Pick, of course, got in quite a lot of trouble about pushing the Piccadilly line north of Finsbury Park and the argument that there should be a station every half mile. Um, and it was decided most certainly there would not be because that was always a problem with the original 1906-1907s. Too many stations, too close distance. So this, are, in many respects, interestingly enough, in PCAS, it is interesting. If you're going to get held anywhere in the central area of the Jubilee Line, it'll be probably either side of Southwark, purely and simply because of those short overlaps um, between Waterloo. Um, but it was designed not only because of pressure from local politicians who wanted the area served by a tube station, a dedicated tube station, um, but also an issue of interchange with existing British rail stations, Network South East um, services. The closure of the Jubilee, the existing Jubilee into Charing Cross, of course, severed the link with the suburban railways that served south of the river. And, of course, Southwark Station enables, with its entrances to Waterloo East, for passengers to continue that interchange between suburban services and the underground. I have heard an interesting story, which is that it works quite differently in morning and evening peaks, which is that in morning peaks prior, pan, prior to the pandemic, is that you get quite large numbers of people leaving Network South East suburban services here and joining the Jubilee line, but in the evening peak far less, and that's because people, I think, psychologically feel if they go to Charing Cross, you get a seat on an empty train rather than one that's coming in. Um, I've never stood and counted people in and out, I have to admit, but it's quite possible. It's an interesting example in many respects of how we, we try to make transport planning a very precise science, and in fact actually it's the art of psychology in some respects, how people eventually work their journeys out. But back to the station design, it is of this complex nature, first of all because of those two entrances, one at street level here on the corner of Blackfriars Road and the Cut, and the other, of course, the water of the east platforms effectively up on top of the railway viaduct. And that viaduct plays a key role in the design of this station because the running tunnels actually run effectively under the mainline railway viaducts in this part. So it accounts for these strange three separate escalator shafts. The best way of thinking of it is those escalator shafts fit in the arches. So you leave the piers of the viaduct supported. So this is a matter of threading those three escalator shafts through the existing brick arches to gain access to the lower station concourse. And the levels here are quite complex. Um, not only are you going from street level and viaduct level, you're going to an intermediate concourse level because of the drop of the escalator shafts, which are fixed in terms of geometry, down to that main intermediate concourse which drops you down again through staircases to the platforms themselves. And one of the great things that McCormick, Jameson and Pritchard did here was, first of all, I think, both in terms of customer flow, join that quite complex journey together, but also architecturally managed to take those quite distinctive areas and forms within the station and give them the same architectural language. Um, lots of different shapes and spaces which are very, very effectively joined together here. If the station has one drawback from a station planning point of view, it's that curved staircase down into the curved ticket hall. Um, but it is a very dramatic space as you come in from the corner of, of Blackfriars Road and the cut opposite Palestra. And this ticket hall has real echoes of the 1930s and Charles Holden. 
Um, it's most certainly got the look of, certainly of Arnest Grove and Southgate about it. A passimeter in the middle, in a very modern form, um, and then, of course, the use of lighting to lift the ceiling box. Um, and, in fact, the quality of materials here is, is really clever. It's, it's very, very high. I, I once spoke to one of the engineers, um, and she'd been involved in the specification and overseeing the pouring of the concrete here, and they went to very great lengths to ensure very, very high quality uh, finish of concrete in this work, and it certainly shows. But it also gives you an idea of the move through at the back of the ticket hall to the next component, which is the intermediate glazed atrium, which lights the top of the first flight of escalators um, down towards the intermediate concourse level. And here again you can see very strong use of light, both daylight allowed in, and also, of course, artificial illumination at night time, which allows the station in some respects to glow almost. You can also see the very high quality of materials here in terms of very standard underground granolithic floor, but the use of polished granolithic blocks for the side wall. Very durable. It's a very fine material. I must admit I have an awful lot of time for it. But interesting to see it here used so extensively in wall finishes as well as floor finishes. And that drops you down, of course, to this remarkable space at the top of the three escalator shafts with the passageway leading through to Waterloo East Station in the distance. Now, this, of course, is subterranean. I think you're something like 23 metres below ground, I think, here. Um, and, of course, the highlight of this space is that instead of just having a blank straight wall, there's this incredible glass wall sculpture by Alexandra Belshenko, um, which is a remarkable piece of art. It's probably it's the biggest piece of public art on the underground, other than the Paolozzi, you know, the Paolozzi murals at Tottenham Court Road. And Boy, are they big, I know. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting just to actually have a little look at the design of these. Um, Belshenko actually took, as his starting point, this Friedrich Schinkel illustration. It's an 1815 illustration from the Magic Flute, for a set from the Magic Flute, the Queen of the Night. Um, and although, of course, obviously, our wall at the station doesn't have these remarkable crescent moon and the Queen of the Night rising, you can see the idea here in terms of this almost drawing together of the sky and the stars. And if you look, actually, at the construction of the panels... You can see by the use of this cross etching on these suspended glass panels, you get that sort of idea of immense complexity in terms of its construction and its thought, but a remarkable simplicity in terms of actually what it delivers in that station. And it's an incredibly important highlight uh, in many respects of the site. And it's one of the reasons why the proposals a few years ago for the oversight development at this station really did start to spark an awful lot of interest in this site and also the Jubilee Line extension stations as a whole. There had always been the intention to build an OSD at this site and in fact the station ticket hall particularly was designed to act as a plinth um, but for a fairly modest 12 to 14 storey building and TfL came forward with proposals three four years ago to build a much higher block which would have involved widespread demolition of the ticket hall and intermediate concourse levels to support the building. And I was always slightly sceptical about the design, if only because from a personal point of view, I can say this now, we lost the street corner entrance. The entrance, although would have been simpler in terms of not having that flight of stairs down, was actually round the side, the back side of the station plot. And my own feeling is, is that London Underground needs to fight very hard to make sure it gets the best possible space for its station entrances on the urban streetscape. You know, we're an incredibly important civic amenity. Um, and, you know, we have every right to have, if you like, prime plot in terms of station entrances. To tuck station entrances away um, slightly round corners always seems to be underplaying and downplaying our role. It would also have meant, despite... Ex extensive studies, um, a degree of overcast, of losing quite a lot of the natural light that forms such an important part of the station design, including this wall. The wall wasn't to be touched, 
but the actual openness of the atrium above certainly would have been compromised. And it did spark a demand for this station to be listed by English Heritage. Now, many of you will have heard of the 25-year, 30-year rule, um, and it would have been certainly very unusual for Historic England to have listed a building of this age. But nevertheless, the listing conclusion was actually quite strong. Um, although English Heritage rather tied themselves in knots with the description, it was incredibly important, but it wasn't quite important enough, I think was almost the line. And in fact, it is still the subject of a judicial review. But what it really does mean, apart from the fact it sparked a debate in TfL and planners, which has led to a much simpler solution, and I think a far more acceptable solution for an OSD at this station, it really does bring to mind the fact that, in fact, several of the stations that we have looked at are now not only on the cusp of being listable, but actually probably are listable. Um, you know, listing isn't just about ancient buildings, it's also about representing and celebrating even quite modern buildings. Um, if you look at the lower concourses here, this almost ship prows like centre to the staircases leading down to the platforms, I certainly myself think that this is probably one of the best pieces of 20th century, late 20th century architecture in London. Um, you know, it's incredible use of space and light and material, um, which works remarkably well in many respects as an underground station. And I think it's interesting for those of us you know, who look back over the architectural history of the underground, you know, it, it's difficult, I think, in many respects, for those of us who worked on projects such as this to comprehend that these now, now are capable of being listed buildings. Um, and this is one that certainly, I think, should be. So it's an interesting debate in the fact that these are very iconic already, very iconic. They were iconic when they were opened. These buildings won the Royal Fine Arts Commissions. They won the Architectural Awards for the year 2000. You know, they are a string, if you like, of architectural pearls uh, strung across South and East London that work individually as buildings um, and yet actually work together uh, as an operational railway line. And I think they're very worthy of being celebrated. And I will leave you just with one last one, so talking about the debate as to listing, with the view up the escalator to the Belshenko artwork. Um, and in fact, actually, if you ever do get the chance, and there's nobody ahead of you on the escalator here, which I suppose is more plausible at the moment than was two years ago, it is well worth casting your eyes up to the heavens and imagining the queen of the night at the top of those escalators and that remarkable piece of glass artwork. So thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, very much. I shall come across to my dark corner over here. Um, if you have a question, and we have plenty of time for questions, uh, could you wait for the microphone to come to you? I'll hand mine out to anybody sitting close to the front. Uh, and Jim, I think, is all there ready uh, with another one for the people towards the back. That helps everybody here, to appear, uh, but also those who are listening on YouTube so that we capture both the question and the answer. Um, can I start with one, Mike? Actually, I, was, I, I hadn't realised there was a threat to North Greenwich bus station. What's the issue with that? Um, it is a while, obviously. I mean, I'm four years out of date, although I do keep a bit of an eye open. Um, I'm now, of course, resident in West Yorkshire, which is about as far away from zone six or seven or whatever it is, as you could possibly imagine. Um, but certainly in, in, in the dying days of, of when I worked for LU four years ago, there was a proposal um, for quite widespread demolition of the surface buildings. It wouldn't have touched the actual tube station itself, but it would have shorn off the buildings at the top of the escalator shafts. Um, and the bus station would have been very substantially reconfigured as, as basically the basement of a large block, of course, you know, and... Um, and please don't get me wrong, you know, um, it, it's, it's interesting from two points of view, I suppose, one of which is the importance of developing brownfield sites, and you know, North Greenwich has been an exemplar of brownfield sites arguably ever since the underground opened there in 1999. You know, it's a sensible place to develop, of course it is, you know, it's got all sorts of excellent public transport links. For me, it was about two things, first of all, maintaining the integrity of that link for bus passengers and, um, and, and customers um, because I felt the original proposals, and these may have moved on substantially since I was involved, actually really did short-change our passengers and I felt that was 
a very backward step. But I also think actually it's an incredibly important building in its own right. It, it does spark this debate, I think, about the fact that I mentioned before, during my talk that bus and coach station architecture actually is, you know, has seen a remarkable attrition rate and it carries on. I mean, looking back sort of 40, 50 years, I've been interested in, in the industry. You know, even at my time at LTM, places like St Albans going, you know, almost every decent country area, London transport country area, bus station or bus garage has gone in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, and I, it always felt slightly odd to me that actually one of the most successful in terms of operation, as I was told by, by our operational people, um, as well as actually being one of our most significant structures of the late 20th century, was so easily under threat. And, you know, it's an evolving picture but it's also about, I think, ensuring that when we replace, if we do make the sensible decision to replace such infrastructure, actually we're making it better for our customers in a holistic way. Not just the finances of the organisation, which is incredibly important, but actually in terms of the utility of those pieces of infrastructure for, you know, for our paying punters. Um, and as so I felt that the proposals at North Greenwich really did shortchange an important element of the the equation, which was the people who actually used it. Um, I'm not sure what the status of events are still at North Greenwich. As I say, four years, you know, a lot's changed, obviously, but you know, I can fully understand the need to develop a site like North Greenwich. It makes eminent sense to do it. Um, I think it's just a, a matter of giving it careful consideration and thought as to both the architecture and the utility of the infrastructure. Yeah. OK, there's a hand right up at the back who may be about to give us some answers, but I don't know. Uh, I won't be able to give you an answer other than I think the, the proposals by Calatravas are probably overrun by huge amounts, whatever happens. But I, I wanted to ask about the, the Jubilee line extension. I remember it was quite politically mm. controversial that it, it went over time, it went over budget, and it, politically the, the later DLR extensions were used as a stick to beat the Jubilee line extension with, you know, with the, we should do it simpler, we should do it more cheaply, we should... And I wondered whether that had had an effect on what happened with, cro with Crossrail or what is happening with the extension to Battersea. Did that have an influence on, on station developments afterwards, good or bad? Yeah. Um, yes. Now then, I'm going to try and get my thoughts in order. It's, a, it's an interesting question. I mean, in many respects, I think it, it, it probably did. It, it's interesting, I, I think... Did it leave sort of cold feet? I suppose my era at the underground was largely, of course, in the days of PPP. So two things. First of all, it was largely around modernising our existing infrastructure, which, of course, was in very poor condition. You know, that was the major task ahead of the infracodes. Um, so, in fact, it was largely around restoration rather than new. You know, our new projects tended to be either single station projects rather than groups of stations. Until, as you say quite rightly, we got into the Crossrail Elizabeth line era um, and also, of course, the Battersea extension. I'll, I can deal with the Battersea extension far, in a far stronger way because we were very heavily involved in that. That was an LU project in, in many respects. It involved close association, as did, of course, parts of the Jubilee line with developers. Um, and it was interesting, I mean, in, in some respects, of course, the Battersea proposals have been scaled back. There's no two ways about it. Um, you know, and you can see the reasons why. Um, interestingly enough, I think some of the reasons behind the scale of the Jubilee line, of course, wasn't just about grandiosity of scale. It was also about ensuring, I think the underground had long felt the issue of the fact that if you look back to the Victoria line, everything was skimped in some way. You know, it was built to the smallest possible dimensions that we could get away with. In terms, you know, the tunnels were small, the passageways were small. Um, one of the interesting things about the, the Jubilee line, which of course, yes, did of course run massively over budget and over time, um, two things, I suppose. One of which was the complexity. I think sometimes we tend to underestimate. The driving of the tunnels themselves is quite straightforward. It's when you get to the interchange stations that it becomes most complex. You know, so if you do look at places like Westminster and you do look at places like London Bridge, you can see the sort of scale of that. It was interesting in the company looking back on the JLE stations. I had a manager in particular whose name I won't mention 
who cursed these stations. You know, we used to say, it's marvellous, you know, you stand at the station entrance and you can see the trains, metres below you, running around. You, know, you can stand on the platform and get a suntan. Um, and as he pointed out at the time, you know, actually, from a customer point of view, these are bloody long stations, pardon my language, to walk around. <laughs> you know, you have the actual customer disadvantage of time in, in terms of the scale of JLE stations is actually quite measurable. Um, he once did it with a stopwatch. I forget which two stations he did it. And as he pointed out, it took longer to get in and out of the station than it did to travel on the train between the two stations. It's one way of proving a point. So, you know, I think, yes, in terms of scale, it is interesting that future-proofing of design, it was designed to feel open and welcoming. It was designed to carry large numbers of customers without feeling constrained and constricted. And I think, interesting enough, Crossrail, we had very little to do with um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, you know, it was very much a standalone project. And, and the few times I did have any sort of integration with Crossrail... I certainly think in terms of the scale of the infrastructure that they've been building, you know, that again, they rather echo, if not in terms of finishes, um, they're much simpler, much more straightforward, um, you know, so much more budget-driven in that respect, although, of course, there's a degree of budget overrun. Um, I think they've gone again for that idea, actually, of trying to make the infrastructure as large as possible in terms of things like sight lines and capacity. The Battersea extension, as I say, just briefly to come back to it, it certainly has been curtailed, um, both in terms of its scale um, and its operational capacity. Things like overrun tunnels have gone. Um, I think largely they've been delivered. We had some very interesting debates at the start of the planning process. Um, I don't think it, it, it doesn't really need editing out. I, I did sit in a meeting once and somebody said, um, uh, Battersea, um, uh, you can't possibly have a station that, building that hides the power station. And I, I remember thinking at the time that that would actually be actually quite difficult to do, given what else is going on in the vicinity of Battersea Power Station. Um, but, you know, that we really did need this thing about having a civic presence, about actually having station entrances which actually do not rely on sticking a roundel on a lollipop stick to say, here we are. That idea, actually, of having some form of architectural um, standing at street level as part of the civic environment was really important. And I, I was suitably pleased that many of the key elements of both Nine Elms and Battersea actually are still there. I said before I'd have my quibbles about some of the finishes. Um, you know, brushed stainless steel. Um, yeah, I've seen people use Brillo pads on brushed stainless steel. Um, I've seen people paint concrete, fair face concrete, at bank. Um, you know, so, but, you know, there's always that sort of debate. Interesting enough for me, that debate echoes back the sort of finishes that we saw at North Greenwich. I think I, looking back, perhaps I should, my team should have been far bolder. But yeah, so there are parallels and similarities, I think, without a doubt. You know, did the underground get its fingers burnt on the JLE? I think possibly it did, um, in terms of this opinion that grew about the underground's ability to project manage major schemes. Um, I think it's been interesting, of course, that there have been so few major schemes for the underground uh, in subsequent in the last 30 years um, that, in fact, actually has that thesis ever been tested, if you know what I mean? I think Crossrail's quite separate in that respect um, in terms of its management and, and its project. And its scale, of course, you know, it's a, a huge undertaking. Um, but, yes, I, I, looking back... Um, I think I'm getting a clearer picture about the Jubilee Line extension and the politics of it, um, the demands that were made of it, um, actually, you know, the, the design and build process of it, quite interesting, the complexities of it, um, and the political outfall from that. So, sorry, that rambled on a bit, but... Okay, uh, just, just before we move on from that one, just, just to stick with the original premise of the question, my recollection at the time, being there as you were but not as involved as you were in JLE, was that one of the ways in which the project was brought perhaps closer to its budget than it otherwise been was to cut back on some of the station finishes and so on. And I'm thinking of Westminster and the sort of great concrete slabs you see. Were those genuine savings rather than architectural I design? There were some changes, and interestingly enough, um, I mean, for example, London Bridge and, and, and Westminster, where you have those uh, cast panels that inset, you know, the idea that you kept the, 
the open tunnel rings um, and you effectively just use those clamped panels on them. And we did once find a, a panel, there was a proposal to do those inset with granite or marble. Um, um, and the story goes that that just proved too difficult, too expensive, and in fact cast metal was used instead. Oddly enough, speaking from a design point of view, I think the cast metal works possibly arguably better than any stone finishes. Um, I mean, in terms of both durability and also, you know, one of the things, how I ever got the job at LU, I shall never know. I mean, because it was a rapid learning curve about durability of, you know, things that you don't have to worry about as a museum curator. Durability of finishes, maintainability, soundproofing, sound deadening. Um, you know, and of course, nice, bright, shiny surfaces, a bit like this microphone, echo around the building beautifully. Um, you know, with two separate PA speakers in a, in a station, you know, that soon starts booming around. And oddly enough, of course, the use of those almost perforated finishes, say at London Bridge and, and, and Westminster, argue, arguably work better in terms of sound. Um, I think there was a degree of pulling back, but I mean, my sort of understanding certainly is that uh, Paolotti particularly... Um, actually did guide the architect's practices to some very basic finishes, so the large-scale use of, of, of finished concrete. I mean, looking back to Westminster, which was the station that you know, I spent more time nosing around with on behalf of the museum to the, the extent, actually, I think they thought I was working on the project at one point. Um, I don't recall any major stripping back of, of design finishes, um, you know, and, and some of them came in for a lot of stick, like the checker plate flooring on the intermediate landings, you know, which is, is you know, is, I, wouldn't, I certainly would never have got away with that in, in my day in the underground. Um, so I think largely it's interesting um, in that respect, Barry. I think they were relatively basic finishes in the first place. So I don't think there was much to be enabled in terms of budgetary stripping back from, from them. Uh, on, on that level. Okay. Right, there's another question at the back. Richard's got his hand up. Oh, sorry, the lady's got the mic, so we'll take the lady first. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It was very interesting, and it's made me realise there are some stations I haven't been to which I ought to go and have a good look around. Yeah, that's worthwhile. Thank you. <laughs> um, on a slightly different point, which I hadn't planned to make, I think Westminster Station is fantastic. I love it. I think the, when you go up the escalators or whatever and you see all those beautiful, well, I don't know what to call them, modern bits. <laughs> but the reason I was wanted to ask you a question was getting back to the bus depot, Greenwich Bus Depot. And I just wondered if you are really concerned about it. Have you thought of contacting the World Monument Fund. It is a charity in Britain, and it restores buildings under threat. And they have restored Preston bus station that was under threat. Most of their work is in places like Syria, but they do have a, quite a large program in Britain, and I'm sure they, if you contacted them, World Monument Fund, they could at least look at it for you. And they said to me one day, when we stand up, everyone else stands down. So that <laughs> I'll certainly you. pass that on. I mean, obviously, I, I, I do voluntary work for primarily for Save Britain's Heritage, and I do have contacts, um, slightly better contacts these days with the 20th Century Society after Tottenham Court Road. Um, but nevertheless, yes, I mean, it will be interesting to see how that debate goes, you know. Um, uh, primarily, I suspect the view of historic England, obviously, and, and also, as I said before, you know, I, I can understand, you know, the need and the requirement, both financially and operationally, to look at assets. One of the things that was always interesting in, in my role in the company was I used to sit in meetings, you know, about conservation of already listed buildings and heritage sensitive sites. I think one of the challenges we had and one of the things that we brought to the table with people like Historic England and, and monument societies was the fact that we can't afford the transport system like the underground is evolving. You know, we can't afford to pickle. We can't afford to use heritage to pickle our system in aspect. 
So, you know, we were always at the forefront of that debate between demolition, modernization, between renewal and restoration. I think generally, I mean, I think the company was held in very high regard in terms of how it did that. So, I mean, I've, I've never ever thought in, in terms that the company's proposals for North Greenwich is willful at all. It's just part of business. Um, as I think I explained before, my concerns are largely around the fact actually it's about replacing decent infrastructure with poorer infrastructure for the, for the passenger. I think at the end of the day, we have to champion our users rather than, well, alongside, we have to balance that requirement with everything else, all the other financial aspects and redevelopment aspects and densification aspects that, that you know, projects such as that bring. But yes, I'll certainly pass that on to the 20th Century Society. Thank you. Okay, can we get a mic to Richard at the back there? And then I think there was one in the I'm middle heartened. of the hall. You haven't all gone to sleep. <laughs> just on the point we were d discussing just now about uh, the, the finishes at uh, places like London Bridge, Westminster and so on, my recollection from my involvement in the project back in the very early 1990s was that What's appeared in practice, and okay, they, as you say, there may have been scaling, some scaling back, mm -hmm. but certainly is it very much in line with what Roland Paoletti had in mind at the time, which is the, you know, the basic finish. Yeah. Uh, which brings me to the, the point, other point I was going to make. You did allude, allude to it at one point, but the, the almost complete lack of commercial advertising of any conventional sort, as is illustrative in the escalator shaft there. Okay, you've got the, the trackside panels and, and other illuminated adverts, yeah. but the complete lack of any conventional commercial advertising in the places you, you'd normally expect to find them. Yeah. I mean, that has obviously, you know, reared its ugly head. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, I think going back to the lessons I learned, you know, I mean, Commercial advertising has always been incredibly important to the underground. You know, you only got to back, look back to 1906 and 1907, where in fact actually the first thing that happened because the company realised it could make more, as much money out of advertising, was to cover all those lovely Leslie Green tile patterns on Yerkes tube stations. Over, you could equally argue that's one of the reasons why the Roundel came into existence to show you where the name was. I mean, without a doubt, I think there was a deficiency in terms of lack of advertising space. Um, and certainly, you know, the best way to do that is to design it in holistically from the start. And we certainly did, looking back, obviously, at stations like London Bridge, end up with those, you know, remarkably complex retrofitting of escalator advertising panels. You know, and I've always said that generally, I'll talk about this one in a minute, escalator panels, you know, um, obviously they're a brilliant source of revenue and they are in a space where they can generally be handled very well in, in terms of what the public expect an escalator shaft to look like. The big debate, of course, for us was around Canary Wharf um, and the value of that digital screen. And that was a fairly acrimonious debate at times uh, about you know the architectural openness and vastness of that space. You know, we heard arguments about health and safety of people being distracted by the advert and walking off the edge of the escalator. And, you know, it has happened, there's no two ways about it. It's interesting, going back to, to what was being said about the Battersea and Nine Elms extension, and in fact this came to light very strongly, if, if I remember rightly, at the bank, the new Walbrook entrance to bank. We felt that the advertising people would really want the blank end walls, you know, the head walls of escalators. And in fact nowadays they rarely don't want them. Because, of course, the issue of maintaining assets above escalators is hugely difficult, you know, so the, the nature of spaces. But generally, yes, if you can throw a brick bat at it, it's, it's about the fact that in an ideal world, you do design advertising panels in holistically. Um, you know, when we navigated our ways through real stations, as well as, if you like, station designs, you get a fairly strong idea, actually, of the hierarchy of space so that the primary position has to be, I've always argued, for customer signage, passenger signage, you know, so that basically people can navigate their way around stations. And that leads to an interesting tension with adverts, because, of course, what the advertiser wants is to catch your eye, <laughs> and not necessarily where we as station operators might want that to occur, you know. So there's an interesting debate about the primacy of space and positions for signage and... and, and and advertising. 
But it was interesting to say one or two of our more recent stations where I thought they really would have gone for the advertising spots, and actually commercial advertising weren't that interested. They were a bit too complex to maintain and manage. But I think you're absolutely right. You know, Looking back, obviously, there, there was a degree of retrofitting. I mean, these stations weren't without the faults. You know, Canary Wharf, where the be my millimetres, the height of the glass balustrades in the intermediate hall failed the railway inspectorate test and all had to be heightened. Um, London Bridge, really good example actually of the where the passageways lead off the platforms into the lower escalator shafts so of people knocking their head. You know, the, the actual geometry of the space was such. So those large glass balustrades had to be built to, to take people away from corners. Um, you know, so not everything was designed perfectly. Just very briefly, um, in, in terms of, if you like, the, one of the things that I was very fortunate, I was allowed to develop a series of policies around particularly not just individual stations, heritage and design features, but also about lines. Um, and we pushed through the board. The board accepted two major ones. One was the Victoria Line design guidelines, which is about the perpetuation of, of Victoria Line finishes, six by six tiles, um, always keeping the back panels, you know. Um, oddly enough, on the Jubilee line, which we did have a strategy for, it was actually to keep this station free of advertising in terms of no additional advertising. Um, and it is interesting how sparse this one is. And there were occasionally proposals, for example, to put advertising panels at the base of the Belshenko glass panels. <laughs> so, I know, must have been, it never annoyed me quite as much as... as fitting the rubbish bins underneath the Royal Fine Arts Commission award plaque, which probably annoyed me. And because I had to use this station latterly every day, every time I went in and out of that station, I could have torn that litter bin down with my bare hands. Um, yeah, so, you know, that whole idea of actually, you know, station design isn't just about prettiness and being fanciful. I mean, obviously, one of the, the big things I had to learn very quickly in my job, you know, because I'm not station planner, was actually about taking all the requirements, you know, station operations, architectural aspirations, maintenance, the needs of commercial advertising, the needs of, you know, the people who operate our stations, the operators. You know, for years, their needs and requirements, you know, you just need a back room. Well, perhaps you don't. Perhaps you actually need something that enables you to operate this station correctly. Um, so getting it all right in that mix is quite fascinating. Um, and, yeah, you know, I think in that respect there are certain key Jubilee Line stations where, you know, I'm, I have a suspicion, I don't know, I, I was never part of the discussions. You sometimes get the impression, though, that perhaps somebody did pipe up and say, can we have some adverts? And Roland and just quietly breezed on. <laughs> oh, okay. Just leave that to me, you know, nothing ever happened. Um, but, yes, it's interesting how I think if we would... Yeah, the, the, the team I work with at London Underground were part of station design, we would have probably taken a slightly more holistic view of integrating services into these finishes. Sorry, another rambly answer. Yeah, that's fine. There was a hand, did I see a gentleman there, close to that mic? Hello. Um, I wanted to know, uh, architecturally, what is your favourite station on the Underground oh. and what is the worst? Oh. <laughs> How I hate that question. I sometimes think, you know, that my audience is plant somebody to ask me that question every time. And I'm bound to offend somebody, no matter what I say and how I say it. Um, I could give you the pat answer, couldn't I? Which is, of course, I love all of them, all 275. Was it 285 now? Um, I can... I used to be able to tell you the ones that I'd quite cheerfully take a bulldozer to on a fairly regular basis. Um, I think the fascinating thing about the underground is, is just that span of architectural styles that it has. Um, and in many respects, each one has merits. You know, and, and there are stations that I grew very fond of because obviously I, you know, I worked you know, on, on the restoration of you know, Fayon's facades at South Kensington. The rest of the station's a bit of a shambles, but anyway... The outside of it looks quite smart. Um, I must admit, I do... I mean, it's, it's difficult not to admire Charles Holden's work um, because of their boldness in many respects. 
going back to what we were saying, which is that, that you know, from an operational point of view, those Holden stations can be a nightmare. They're very drafty, I'll tell you that much. It's interesting to notice that the latter one's got doors. I wonder why that was. Um, but, you know, just the generosity of space and, and the inherent... I think one of the things for me that makes Charles Holden stand out as an architect is he, he was an architecture of interior spaces as much as exterior spaces. Um, which I've always found fascinating. But it's easy, you know, equally I can draw, you know, I can throw brickbats at some of the stations in that they tend to fall apart at platform level. You know, quite often Holden didn't see an entire station through, if you know what I mean. Um, I grew to love Tottenham Court Road, the great Marmite moment of the underground, um, where when we did the congestion relief works 10, 12 years ago now, of course, there was a very strong feeling in the company that we should spray creep the Palazzi murals and get them out of the way, as well as removing the walls that they were on. And that was one hell of a battle, I'll be quite honest about. You know, we, whatever we did there was wrong <clears throat> to somebody. Um, and we, you know, obviously it was a massive learning curve. But actually, I, the more I think about it, some of those 1970s and 80s, you know, things like David Gentleman's mural artworks, which we'd never get away with now because they take all the advertising space on the walls. Um, actually, I like. But, yeah, I think the... Uh, yeah, I, I must admit, I, I like Westminster. If I, had to, if I had to choose one station, and, and perhaps that's because... I've got a very personal attachment to it. I knew the people who built it very well. I was, I was involved with some of the project team there. For, as I say, from the day they took possession of the St. Stephen's Club, I was there um, to the day to open to the public. So it's the one station I've sort of ever seen all the way through process. Um, you know, it's like I never saw a train fleet through process on the underground. I'm still slightly spitting feathers that I didn't see the new Piccadilly line rolling stock through the design book phase to build. Um, but I do like, I think Westminster is it's the space. It's as our other question, that's the other question was, it's just that incredible nature of the space, the spatial nature inside. So I think, yeah, stations, you know, we've got pretty stations, you know, like Lout. I'm very fond of Loughton, interestingly enough, not by an underground architect, of course, by Murray Easton Partners for the LNER. You know, we're very fortunate. We've got some superb, if you like, country-style stations, you know, on the GR and GNR lines. Um, you know, some of the best preserved... Snaresbrook is a gem. Snaresbrook Station is incredible. How that hasn't been listed, I shall never know. Um, and if that's broadcast, bad luck to HE. Um, you know, it's... It, it's it is quite a remarkable survivor in, in so many ways, and it shows the progression from the original Eastern Counties Railway to the GR, to the LNER, to London Transport, you know. Um, so we're very fortunate we have such a wide breadth of stations that you can choose from. Um, but yes, so my split is almost between, if you like, station exteriors. So, you know, you've got, I mean, Arnest Grove has to be a very strong, you know, in terms of its exterior. Um, Westminster for its interior, closely followed possibly by those ruddy mosaics at Tottenham Court Road. Because so I think I think I always used to say that you know when I eventually popped my clogs and you know if you saw me in half you'd find a round one. I'm beginning to think you'd found Parloxi murals nowadays. But anyway, but yeah, I think they're prob probably sort of about my best. I'll, I'll see. I'll see if I can push a little. Pardon. Bit. Where, where, where was the bulldozer here? The was bulldozer there. ones, well, they're not much surface. I mean, it's somewhere Old Street. Oh, God. It's interesting looking back on stations that we came up with proposals to do something with. Um, and, you know, we never, for, you know, for whatever reason, of course, obviously, station plans fall apart. You know, I mean, we spent a lot of time, obviously, resigned Camden Town until that got canned. But, no, there are, I, mean, I must admit, Old Street to this day <laughs> It's one of those stations that even to travel through sort of makes you think we really, you know, I know it was, it's interesting, of course, at platform level, it's, it, it was one of the trial designs almost in some respects for some of the Victoria Line finishes. And that leads me on to my absolute bete noir of a station, which I shall let slip of in a minute. And it's one of those stations where, you know, I can sort of see the bare bones of 
the possibilities of that station, of every station, I'm not slagging stations off, and I don't want to make the staff who work there feel as if they work in the worst station on the underground, because um, it's not my business anymore. Um, Old Street is a bit of a disaster area, but the one, and I, I, I recently, I'm blabbering a bit now, um, I gave a, a, a Zoom lecture on, interestingly enough, was the history of Highbury and Islington Station. Oh, yes, that got a quite a few groans from the audience. Um, and, I mean, H&I really is a, a disaster area. Um, and I remember working with Tim O'Toole when he was MD, and we came up with... It's a very complex station. This is another talk, isn't it, Highbury and Islington Station? Right. Yeah. Um, <coughs> have to be careful. Left, yeah. What I was going to say is closing time. Oh, yes, right. Um, but H and I, obviously, you know, there's been it really is a shambles at street level, um, and yeah, I know it's complex, and, and I've spent a lot of time looking in the archives as to why potentially it was so complex, and it's a, you know it's to do with land ownership and network rail and overbridges and this that and the other, and eventually I landed actually very late on when I was I, I need to do some more research on it. I think it's only ever been a temporary building because it suddenly dawned on me, of course, it was slap bang in the middle of Ringway 2, the GLC's great motorway box. And if you actually look at the plans, it would have sheared through Highbury Corner, almost where Highbury and Islington Station is. Um, but, you know, there is a campaign to rebuild the original North London Railway H&I station, which I think is an interesting one. There's, uh, I think... You know, there is a bit of the original station column there. I'm not quite sure you can grow it from the rest of it. Um, but H and I is pretty awful, I think, you know, both in terms of piecemeal, uh, you know, additions. Uh, you know, if ever there was a station that really does deserve a, a, a you know, new station box and look, I think it's probably that one. So, yeah, that's my worst, H and I and Old Street. So. Excellent. Right, we'll have the last one from Stephen <coughs> down here, and I can hand the mic over. Thank you. Um, obviously, the extension stations were designed in the days of ticket offices and the need to accommodate queues at the windows. Now that ticket offices are no longer a thing, would that make, does that make a difference to your station design? Um, it, it does. A, it's interesting, you know, because as you say, um, and there are people in the audience here tonight who spent quite a large chunk of their career putting ticket offices into underground stations, only for us then to go back and ask the question 20 years after, how do we take them out? Um, which is actually a very difficult job. I mean, yes, obviously it's changed a degree of the rationale. I mean, you know, the need for secure suites in that respect, you know, the need, obviously, one of the big things around the UTS was about building secure spaces for money handling, and the fact that technically, you know, there's no need to handle money now. I mean, obviously, in the latter days of my career, there were still ticket machines which needed a degree of attendance. You know, you have to be able to get in them. And the debate about front-loading machines and rear-loading machines did change the operation. I mean, one of the main things around station design really is, 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 is the transfer of importance, I think, over the past 50, 60 years, um, where the ticket office was the major function in terms of station operations, to the station control and operation rooms, which of course now is the major hub, you know, and reconstruction of existing stations, you know, if we ever did manage, there were lots of stations we'd have cheerfully, I'd love to have taken the ticket office out of Rains Lane and reopened the northern entrance. Really would have loved to have done that. You know, the, the UTS ticket office there so affected the flow, it so affected the architecture. You know, but trying to take a fairly, almost like a strong room out of the station doesn't come cheap in that respect. But the control rooms are now even more significant and more expensive to move. So I think in that respect, there's possibly almost like there's been a shift, but actually only a slight shift in terms of actually what's needed in ticket hall levels from an operations point of view. So that swap from ticket hall importance, sorry, ticket office importance, over to control room importance. Um, I mean, it'd be interesting to see in the next few years, even if there's a need for ticket machines. And um, I've just been talking about UTS, Nick. So, yeah, as you've stepped in at the right time. Um, but, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to see if there's even a need for ticket machines in the next few years. And obviously the nature of gate line flows. I mean, gate lines do have uses, obviously, in that it allows you to control the flow of customers through a ticket hall. I'm sounding very Birmingham now. I always slip back into my brummy childhood and I say, ticket all. Um, but, you know, I can just as a, as a last 
anecdote, I can remember, you know, the issue about between traditionally underground stations had Boswick gates. And we had a few stations which had very big Boswick gates, and we had to do trials to see if all the station staff could actually physically drag the gates backwards and forwards. So, of course, the next obvious suggestion is shutters, shutter entrances. But in fact, you know, it's actually a Boswick gate. A gate that does that is really useful for controlling the flow into stations. A shutter is not as much use unless you want people to sort of limbo down to under it or they're quite short or they're prepared to crawl into a station. And I'm sure some of us remember city gents on the Friday night crawling into a station was probably the best thing they did. But it's interesting, yeah, as you say, that is the nature of the entrance to a station changing, I suppose, is, is, is really what... And yes, it is. It's shifting. Um, and, you know, it's not for me to discuss the politics of ticket office closures, but, you know, the idea behind staff meeting and greeting. Um, I think one thing that the underground has carried forward, uh, and quite rightly, is, you know, the need for a human presence to have members of station staff available for, for, for passengers, I think, is really key, and I think they've been very strongly about that. But it also leads me, you know, in all the years I worked for the company, in one role or another, you know, never directly operationally as such, but the highest admiration I have, I still think the most difficult job on the underground is, a, is basically a zone one gate line attendant, because I think if anybody can do that job... <laughs> You know, sort of, you know, you're a slightly better person than I am. Um, you know, they're the real people. They're the real face of the underground. You know, if they be, no matter where they are, they are there dealing with our passengers day in, day out. And that goes to the core, as I think I've hoped to try to say, about station design. You know, it has to work both for, you know, it has to work for our passengers as well as, in fact, it has to work for our operational staff to enable them to carry on with their journeys. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, I shall draw the line there. Um, before I thank Mike, just to recap, uh, we will have one last meeting here before we break for Christmas. And in fact, it'll be an extended Christmas break because we can't back, come back into the Cubic Theatre during January because there's some work's going to be carried out here. Um, so the last meeting until next February um, it will be on the 13th of um, December. Uh, we will open up the bookings for that on the website um, during the course of tomorrow morning, so you can book if you want to come. And I should perhaps say that if anybody didn't come to Andrew Braddock's talk uh, a month ago, which was a great um, forceful presentation on transport policy, that's available online uh, uh, through YouTube. Uh, and so too is the talk which was to an invited audience um, a couple of months ago now uh, by Sir Peter Hendy. Uh, and if you haven't looked at that one, I urge you to do that. Uh, an excellent presentation on uh, the recent organisation of the railways post-privatisation uh, and a look very much from the inside, knowing what Sir Peter knows uh, on how Great British Railways may develop in a year or so's time. Um, so those are two past ones to look at on YouTube, uh, as this one will be, um, but uh, as many of you this can come on the 13th of December, but please book. Um, we look forward to seeing you there for Oliver Green's talk on London or railway stations. Mike, thank you very much. Excellent, informative, entertaining presentation. Thank you for being uh, very forthcoming in the answers to those questions. Diplomatic, I think, but forthcoming as well. Um, it is always, as I've said many times from this spot, um, really good to hear from people who were there at the time, who were party to the discussion, know what the issues were, what the challenges were, what the uh, comments and criticisms were, um, to get it, if you don't mind me saying so, from the horse's mouth in the nicest possible way. Um, so I'd ask you, please, ladies and gentlemen, just to say thank you in the usual way to Mike. <laughs> Thank you for attending. Safe journey home for those that are actually leaving physically this place as opposed to simply switching off their YouTube. And we'll see you in December.